Is this a value play at this point, given that we continue to see more signs of this cash crunch in the property sector, not to mention that we really have no clue about what other sort of regulatory crackdowns we could see in the tech sector? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, uh, very good morning to you and our viewers. You're right in saying that the property sector cash crunch still continues and so does the regulatory uncertainty. Um, one would like to believe that the worst of the regulatory pressures are behind us, but last week's development on some of the food delivery companies kind of belies that point. However, what we do like about China, and more specifically about the developed Asia banks, are two points. Number one, there's a clear policy shift in China in favor of growth support. And that's something new which we began to see from late last year. And that enthusiasm, we are currently constructive on China, particularly in Chinese industrials, on Chinese consumer discretionaries. We will possibly maintain that stance for now. As far as the developed Asia banks, and that includes Hong Kong banks, are concerned, the yield ascent is a clear tailwind for their net interest margins. We have seen how um, the Hong Kong banks, the Korean banks, the Singaporean banks have behaved. There is a strong expectation of the interest margins increasing going forward, and we think that tailwind is likely to last for now. When it comes to the Chinese yuan, we have seen a lot of resilience there, despite the fact that we continue to see the suggestions that there might be divergence in their monetary policies. Where do you see the currency going? Um, you know, the, this uh, monetary policy divergence is a topic of discussion, no doubt. Um, and we have already seen that with the PBOC reducing the interest rates and Fed likely going the other way around quite clearly. Um, but we think that in the medium term, it's China's strong trade surplus. That's a stronger variable in influencing China's currency um, than the monetary policy divergence. In fact, this tug of war between monetary policy divergences and the trade deficit is also visible in another market, that's Korea, where the trade surplus actually turned into a trade deficit. Monetary policies are similar in terms of direction between the Bank of Korea and the Fed, but that really isn't helping the Korean currency. It's the trade deficit that's influencing, that's exerting a stronger pressure on the Korean currency. So I think this is something we have to look forward to. We think the Chinese currency would remain stable for now. Um, we have a target of somewhere in the range of 6.3 to 6.4 for the foreseeable time horizon. How does that inform then some of the opportunities that you see within the South Korean equity market? Right. We are overweight South Korea, um, despite the pressure on the currency that I just talked about, because we think that Korean tech hardware universe is clearly benefiting from the chip prices, the DRAM prices increasing. And that uh, the demand in that particular segment is likely to remain for now. The Korean banks, which is the second most important sector over there, they're benefiting because of expectations of net interest margins increasing the bank's guidance about their lending growth, that has also been quite satisfactory. In fact, quite a positive surprise compared to, you know, the previous years. So these are the two large pockets that we are present in, in Korea, as far as our Asian model portfolio is concerned. And, um, you know, I think that chance will continue for now. Uh, the most contrary view you say that you hold is being overweight on India. Do you think the, uh, the sell-off has been overdone and there's now opportunity to get back in? Um, we think so. In fact, we think that the Indian market, despite being overvalued, being at a premium valuation compared to the Asian peers, is actually growth supported. If one looks at the consensus earnings growth estimates in 2022 and 2023, that's significantly, handsomely higher than the Asian peers. The return on equity estimates are also significantly higher. And at the same time, we think that the market is, the economy is in an early stage of economic recovery. There have been quite a few supply-side measures 
put in by the government of India, we think they're going to have an influence on the CAPEX cycle going forward. So yes, I mean, we do have a constructive stance on India for now. Um, we have been overweight for some time, and we will continue with that stance. Mm -hmm. um, the FII selling, we think, has been influenced by a consideration of the Fed rate increases as well, and there's a concern that the currency would possibly depreciate. But one has to remember that uh, you know, the, the forex reserves in India have grown to such an extent that the foreign debt and even the, right. if the trade deficit increases, there's a strong enough cushion over there. And Manisha, just quickly, is it inevitable to be constructive on energy right now? We are hearing from the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida saying that he won't rule out any options in tackling oil prices, I mean, with the Ukraine tensions. How has that changed your view on the energy sector so far? Well, in the near to medium term, there does not seem any alternative. One has to be, uh, you know, constructive. One has to be overweight on the energy stocks, particularly the exploration and production stocks. Um, as a combination of global demand recovery influencing oil prices and also the geopolitical tensions, which are an additional tailwind for energy prices. These two factors seem, you know, we are unable to get away from them in the foreseeable time horizon. So we do have significant exposure to the energy stocks, particularly in China and India, but also in Southeast Asia.